If you're someone who's experiencing endometriosis, you're probably looking for anything that will help improve your experience with it. And today we're going to be talking about something extremely powerful that will probably surprise you uh, in terms of what you can be doing day to day to improve uh, the severity and extent, uh, how much of your endometriosis is present in your body. Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia Mills and welcome to the Wild Wisdom Show. I'm a specialist in physical medicine rehabilitation, practicing functional medicine, also known as root cause medicine. And I love taking complicated science and breaking it down so that you can understand it and action it for immediate results. And today what we're going to be talking about is, is my endometriosis connected to my stress, the science on the surprising role of the immune system? So it's super fascinating because we're not just giving stress lip service. Uh, everyone knows that stress isn't good for you. But research on endometriosis specifically has found that stress through the immune system, which we're going to talk about, actually can worsen endometriosis. And at the end, I'm going to give you a very specific tip that does not involve meditation that you can incorporate into your life to decrease that stress immediately starting today. So I uh, can look forward to uh, interacting with you if you're joining me live through my fa free Facebook group for wo uh, women, Wild Wisdom for Women with Dr. Patricia Mills. Please feel free to put in your name, where you're calling in from, and ask your questions because I will be sure to answer them for you. So let's dive right in. Endometriosis, what the recent research has shown is that endometriosis, uh, and we've been covering this over the last few episodes, I'm going to review a little bit of information here that will put everything into context. And what it is, is that endometriosis is tissue that looks like the lining of the uterus, and the lining of the uterus is called endometrium. However, endometriosis is when tissue like that lining is present outside of the uterus. So it can grow on the outside rather than the inside of the uterus. It can grow on ovaries. It can spread to the lining of the abdominal cavity. It can grow on uh, the colon. So it can be there. And in some rare cases, it can actually go beyond the abdominal cavity into the lungs and you know present a shortness of breath so usually it presents as pain uh, in that deep abdominal region and that pain can be present most of the time or more commonly it's present cyclically so with uh, hormone fluctuations during your menstrual cycle and what's interesting is that they found that when they compare this endometrium like tissue to actual endometrium tissue the difference one of the major differences is that there's this increased activity of an enzyme. And an enzyme uh, is like a tool in the body. It's a protein that is built to be like a tool and it has a function in your body. And in the normal endometrium, this enzyme called aromatase is not active. So it's not working. It's turned off. And what this enzyme does is it takes testosterone and turns it into estrogen. This enzyme is turned on in places like the ovary, and that's actually how women get their estrogen production predominantly, is that the aromatase enzyme turns testosterone into estrogen in the ovaries. And this enzyme, of course, can't be turned on in every tissue in the body. We would just be making way too many hormones. So the, the, you know, there's this genetic code that usually um, codes for us having it turned on in places like the ovary and turned off in places like the endometrium, the lining of the uterus. But for reasons we don't yet understand, it's turned on in this endometriosis tissue. So endometriosis has increased production of estrogen within the tissue itself. And we know that excess estrogen is like the Goldilocks, you know, having too much and having too little is not good. And in the case of endometriosis, we have too much estrogen. And what's interesting Listen, about estrogen is, is that we can, oh, sorry about that, we just have an issue here. I'm just going to turn this off. I usually turn off my phone, but I just realized I didn't today. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so what we have here is a case of too much estrogen production and estrogen is, to excess estrogen causes inflammation in the body. 
uh, in, and in the local tissue where it's in excess. And what's interesting is that this fact that aromatase activities increase in endometriosis has been very well documented since the early 2000s to the point where there's actually medications that are prescribed to inhibit, inhibit aromatase activity. And in previous episodes, I've talked about a diet that can decrease its activity, supplements that can decrease its activity. And what we also need to be aware of is what can increase it so that we can avoid those things. So I'm going to cover what can increase the aromatase activity and its link to inflammation in the immune system and stress. First, I want to uh, acknowledge that there are a few people that are joining me here through the Facebook group. There's Gina. Thank you, Gina, for joining. And Brittany is saying here, um, she's asking a question and I'll, I'll write, I'll say the question and then we'll see if this is a good time to cover it or towards the end. So Brittany's saying, um, so a hysterectomy wouldn't cure it, cure endometriosis. My aunt wants me to have one, but that's not what I want or need. Now that's a very interesting comment, Brittany, because you are quite correct. A hysterectomy doesn't necessarily cure endometriosis. If the endometriosis is on the outside of the uterus and your surgeon, uh, your doctor in combination with the surgeon think that by uh, removing the endometriosis that it would improve your symptoms. Like, so some people have endometriosis tissue and they don't actually have any pain or any problems from it. And it can be discovered by accident as in they're looking, there's an operation for something else and they're looking in the abdomen and they see the endometriosis tissue. Other people can have a very tiny amount of endometriosis tissue and there's so much inflammation in that tissue, so much excess estrogen production in that tissue that even that small amount of tissue is resulting in significant pain because the result of inflammation is pain. The pain from endometriosis comes from the inflammation in the tissue. If there is no or little inflammation in the endometriosis tissue, there won't be pain. So whatever you can do to decrease the inflammation, to decrease that estrogen excess, to turn down and turn off the aromatase activity in that endometriosis tissue, the better. If your pain, which let's say you have significant pain and the only place you have the tissue is in on top of the uterus, um, then a hysterectomy could be potentially helpful in the short term. But remember, whatever is driving that inflammation, if you don't address the root cause, it'll still be there. So this is a perfect segue. And thank you, Brittany, for your question. And I feel your pain. This is a very difficult thing to be considering a hysterectomy for endometriosis. My heart goes out to you. So what, um, what are the root causes that if you simply surgically remove the endometriosis and you don't address what's driving it, why is that important? Because then if the root causes persist, that means triggers for inflammation persist, and that could show up in other areas of your body in different ways, right? Because inflammation is harmful for every tissue in the body. And if you're genetically predisposed for endometriosis being one of the ways it shows up for you, then that's what you're going to most significantly experience. But if you don't address the root cause, the inflammation is going to start harming other parts of your body. And over time, you could develop issues with your joints, with your skin, with your brain health, with your hormone health all sorts of things. Again, it depends on your genetics and how that's going to show up, but these triggers, these root causes will harm you in the long term if you don't address them. So what are those triggers and root causes? What increases aromatase activity are dietary th uh, factors, and I covered that in uh, one of the recent episodes, the endometriosis diet, so things to avoid. And the flip side is things to add to decrease the aromatase enzyme activity and decrease inflammation. Toxins. So again, my most recent episode was on the impact of environmental toxins, which are coming into us through our cosmetics, through what we're eating and drinking, and what we can do to avoid and eliminate those toxins from our body. And anything that increases inflammation. So inflammation 
directly stimulates aromatase activity through this one specific molecule, especially called prostaglandin E2. Uh, too much information, but I just want you to know that this is specific data in research. And so what is the connection between stress? Because today we're going to talk about stress and inflammation, because what, what I could say is that stress increases the aromatase enzyme activity. Now, you may be listening to this and, and thinking to yourself, you know, I, uh, okay, I can see, I'll think about the diet part. Uh, I've covered supplements that will improve, um, you know, inflammation and aromatase enzyme activity in a previous episode as well. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to my fi uh, my endometriosis playlist. If you're listening to this on podcast, just go back to the most recent episodes. Um, but when you're listening to this, if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I don't think stress is an issue for me. What I have to say is this. I was a person who used to think that stress was not an issue for me. And then over time, I realized that I had kind of disconnected my brain from my body in the sense that I uh, thought that I was coping well with stress. And the reality is that modern day life is so incredibly stressful compared to what our body was designed to handle. And so our body was designed to handle, um, you know, minor um, episodes. Okay, let me rephrase that. We used to live in forests and jungles in, you know, tribal communities. You know, uh, we'd have assistance with um, activities like foraging, hunting, gathering. Uh, if we were raising children, we had help from the tribe. And the times where we're, that were stressful were during warfare, which weren't that frequent, hopefully, you know, depending on what time you were born into in the past. And if you were to run into some kind of like a, a tiger or a bear, you know, in the jungle or the forest, and you had to turn on your stress response very quickly and significantly to get away from that threat. And as soon as the threat was gone, if you survived that encounter, um, you would, you know, you would uh, quickly return back to your low level of stress life. And what's happened is that with our modern day stress, with exposure to things like daily news, waking up with an alarm clock, being fairly isolated from each other in society, raising children, you know, without significant assistance day to day in the home uh, from people outside, you know, even with family, but, you know, from, you know, lack of a tribe, uh, social media, you know, comparisons and uh, all these sorts of things are leading to a significant amount of stress, our work expectations, um, the stress that comes from our, you know, uh, lack of being taught how to cope with this. Now, the thing is, I'm not saying that the solution is to remove yourself from modern society. In fact, that's not possible, right, for most people. You can't go up into a monastery and uh, meditate your days away. So the thing is what we, the missing piece for, for many of us, and I think our children are actually getting this in schools more and more. They're being taught things like mindfulness and meditation and breath work. But my generation and a few, gener you know, a generation below or so, and definitely the generation above, we were not taught strategies to cope with stress and we are seeing the effects of this in our health and if you think you don't have that issue then you're probably like i was like a duck paddling in water so the duck looks so calm above the surface but underneath the feet are just going like paddling like crazy and that's what's happening in our body our mind has adjusted to the stress but our body is coping with the stress daily and if we don't institute some body practices to reduce the stress we're going to experience problems and i'm going to show you what happens what what is happening in our bodies as a result of this daily stress so uh, towards the end, I'm going to see here um, a comment uh, from Brittany, but I'm going to, um, Brittany, sh um, just wait for towards a little bit towards the end to respond to that. Thank you so much for your participation. Keep it up. I love it. So what we're seeing is here is that the, the connection between stress and inflammation is the immune system. So let's define these a little bit before we move on, because knowledge is power. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is the reaction of the body to any kind of physical or mental stress. So physical stress would be like a cut, you know, um, and you see it physically on the skin, uh, where if you cut yourself, there's 
uh, a localized inflammation response happens where the immune system, the part of the body that's responsible for many things amongst which are uh, fighting off invading bacteria and viruses. So it's like our defense system. It's also our repair system. So it's what goes to the cut and starts to, you know, clean up the broken parts and heal up the, you know, the cut parts, get rid of the junk and lay down new tissue. Um, and so it's, and as a result of that, you get the localized redness um, because there's increased blood flow directed towards it to bring the immune system in. There's swelling because there's more water flowing in there again to get that immune system in. There's more lymphatic fluid. The, the immune system travels through the lymphatic system as well as the blood. So you get that uh, localized redness and swelling and pain because a lot of the um, factors that are released to kill the, you know, any kind of invading bacteria or viruses or fungi, um, as well as to help in repair, like signal the need for repair, those molecules like prostaglandin e, uh, E2, interleukin-6, those are all molecules that uh, get released locally in the tissues. And the one of the things it does is they stimulate the nerve fibers and that causes local pain. So it's kind of like short-term pain for long-term gain. And that's a healthy kind of inflammation. The unhealthy kind of inflammation is the kind that happens uh, day in and day out due to internal injury and, from mental and physical stress. And what's very fascinating is that research has shown that mental stress induces internal inflammation. So it turns on the immune system inside of us, which causes the immune system to be overactivated for long periods of time, which leads to inflammation. So we get internal damage from inflammation because a little bit of inflammation is good. Too much inflammation is bad. You get that persistent release of those chemicals that cause the short-term pain for long-term gain. The thing is inside of us, we don't have the same kind of sensation as we do on the skin. So it's not the same kind of pain, but we do get some signals that it's happening. So some of the signals are the endometriosis associated pain. Other signals are things like joint pain, tissue swelling, water retention, weight gain, or too much weight loss, depending again on your genetics, maybe some brain fog, fatigue at, during the day, um, insomnia and difficulty falling asleep at night. Some people experience it as redness in the skin, so acne, eczema, psoriasis, uh, dermatitis, so inflammation shows up in many different ways and in and, and different ways in different people, depending on your genetics. And what's fascinating is that we didn't understand the connection between stress and disease until they found this common pathway of inflammation. And this was just published in the Frontiers of Human Neurosciences in 2017. And the, the title of the study is Inflammation, the Common Pathway of Stress-Related Diseases. So this is kind of breaking news and this information is so powerful because once you start to understand the physical connection between stress and disease being through inflammation, you can start to uh, understand the necessity to uh, find ways to cope with it and deal with it, which again, I will give you a very specific strategy that will only take five minutes a day um, and I'll, I'll teach you that at the very end. So stick with me here. So interestingly, a study in humans showed that catastrophizing increases inflammation. So catastrophizing is kind of like, um, so, so stress really depends on how, the way you perceive things. So let's say um, you have two people watching the same piece of news and one person watches the news and they and they go, oh my God, this is terrible. What are we gonna do? You know, the world is falling apart and, and everything's so hard. And the other person listens to the news and says, okay, that is information. Um, I'm gonna decide what to do with that information. Let me go look up a little bit more. Or you know what, this is information, but maybe I'm gonna decide to not take this on. This is not directly affecting me. There's nothing I can do to influence it. And therefore I'm not gonna let it stress me out. I'm not gonna catastrophize. And interestingly, what they found was that when they um, when they submitted humans to stress a stressful event like pain, just that's one way to cause stress in a human is to submit them to pain. And they measured markers of inflammation in the body. In this case, they measured interleukin six. Again, it's a something you find in the blood that goes up when you have internal body inflammation. And they found that the people who were 
catastrophizing about the stressful event, like, you know, really making a mountain out of a molehill compared to the other people who weren't, had more inflammation. So it's not even so much what you're exposed to, it's your perception of what you're exposed to. So learning how to view things in your life and changing your perception of it will be enough to decrease the inflammation in your body, which is kind of crazy cool. So I love this. And for those of you who are interested, um, the study was published in the Journal of Pain in 2008 called the Association of Catastrophizing with Interleukin-6 Responses to Acute Pain. So then the question becomes, okay, well, this is a talk about endometriosis. Does stress specifically worsen endometriosis? And what's fascinating is this has been studied, not in humans yet, but the initial animal studies have been done. Two animal studies have been done, and the results are worth discussing um, because they were very fascinating. So what they found was that they did two studies. One study was if you uh, have stress before, so if you're in a stressful state and then you develop endometriosis, is your outcome going to be worse than if you're not stressed out and you develop endometriosis? So what they did is that they subjected these poor rats, you know, thank you rats and all the animals who um, are basically, you know, giving their lives for science. Um, that's a whole other topic in and of itself, but it does provide us with very useful information. So thank you rats. These rats were subjected to stress or not divided into two groups. And then they have found a way to cause endometriosis in rats. So they caused endometriosis to happen in the rats. And what they found that the rats who had been previously exposed to stress for just 10 days before they were subjected to, to um, a method to develop endometriosis, the one subjected to stress had significantly more endometriosis happen. And the endometriosis that did happen in those stressed out rats had more inflammation. So they actually, you know, surgically opened up these racks and looked at the tissue and examined the chemistry. And they found that visually and chemically, the endometriosis was much worse if they had been stressed out. So then the question is, well, what if I already have endometriosis and I undergo stress? Does it make it worse? Does, my, does it contribute to my pain flares and the inflammation? And they did do a study on this too. The same group that did the first study did the second study because they recognized that that was a different kind of question that required a different kind of study. And this uh, research paper was published in 2018. So again, fairly new. And what they found was that when they had these animals develop endometriosis and then subjected one part of the group to stress and the other one not, the one that was subjected to stress had more immune system activation, had more endometriosis lesions. So their endometriosis, so their endometriosis grew in size. They had more lesions, so you could see more endometriosis in the body. And those patches had more immune system activation, call like moving towards these patches and causes inflammation. And fascinatingly, they had more nerve fiber growth in the uterus. And you know that you can't measure pain in animals as well as you can in humans, but basically what you know is that if you have more inflammation and you have more nerve fiber growth, um, you're, you're usually going to experience more pain. So that was incredibly fascinating. I don't know if they're ever going to be able to do this research in humans because it would be hard to get a group of people with endometriosis that would agree to be subjected to stress and then surgically evaluated for whether or not their endometriosis got worse. So we may only have these studies to rely on. And I, in my opinion, they are sufficient evidence um, in addition to the understanding that we have on the effects of stress, inflammation, and endometriosis. Um, to say that stress is probably a significant contributor and it's worth addressing this. And I'm going to teach you how to reduce stress quickly without meditation using only five minutes a day. So what I have here is a uh, human study that was done by in the Huberman labs. Um, and I love, um, you know, Dr. Huberman's really fascinating. He's got a great podcast as well. And the study was uh, re uh, published just in 2023 in January. So it's like hot off the press. 
and it's called Brief Structured Respiration Practices Enhance Mood and Reduce Physiological Arousal, or in, any word, in other words, reduce the effects of stress. And what they did is a very high quality randomized control trial where they took people and subject and put them through three different kinds of um, breathwork exercises compared to a group that did five minutes of mindfulness meditation. They studied this over one month. So every day, uh, depending on what group you belong to, you had to do um, either a kind of breath work or a meditation. And the breath works that they uh, studied, which I thought was interesting, was a cyclic sighing, where you have a more pronounced exhale, box breathing, where it's the same duration of inhalation, breath retention, and exhalation, breath retention, retention back to inhalation. And the third one was cyclic hyperventilation. So you inhale longer and then exhale shorter, sort of like that hyperventilation breathing. And what they found was that what was even better than five minutes of meditation, of mindfulness meditation, was a cyclic sighing. So I'm going to show you how to do it, and let's do it together for, for a, a few breath cycles. So what it is, it's a prolonged exhale. So you inhale in, and then exhale out longer. Breathe in again. Exhale out longer. Wow, that really works. So if you are someone who is experiencing endometriosis or any other kind of stress-related disease, which by the way um, is like cancer, diabetes, fibroids, um, you know, Alzheimer's, all different kinds of things have been related to inflammation, which is worsened by stress. Five minutes a day of cyclic sighing could be extremely helpful for your condition in terms of decreasing the size and the inflammation causing pain. And remember, it's not that doing this on its own will make a significant difference, just like just change, just taking supplements um, or just paying attention to toxins or just paying attention to the diet. It's all of these things together, hitting it from every angle that will make probably the best difference in your endometriosis. And whether or not you are considering getting surgery um, or taking a medication, either trying this before, this, this really holistic approach before to see how good you get and therefore that might either mean you don't need a medication or surgery or maybe you don't need as much medication or maybe the surgery doesn't have to be as extensive or using it in combination with because there's no reason why not to and again it might decrease your need for medication and decrease the extent of your surgery and it could improve your outcomes after your surgery if that's what you decide to go and get and again um, Brittany here was saying that, um, you know, she, she's being told that from a family member that maybe a hysterectomy would be uh, useful. And what Brittany is saying is that she was found, the endometriosis was found during her umbilical hernia surgery last July 19th and found that she has stage four endometriosis and also has fibroids. What I want to say about that uh, to to you, the listener, and um, and this will also help um, Brittany, is that this increase in um, aromatase activity, interestingly, is found not only in endometriosis but also in fibroid tissue and breast cancer tissue. So everything you can do to improve your diet. Um, support uh, your, you know, your system in decreasing the aromatase activity with a combination of a diet and possibly the supplements that I recommend in the previous episode, uh, looking at your toxins exposure and, and assisting your body's natural detoxification systems and reducing your stress. All of these things not only helps endometriosis, but also helps fibroids, uh, endometrial cancer, breast cancer, all of these hormone sensitive uh, conditions where the estrogen production is increased due to this increase in aromatase activity. So while it's extremely, extremely unfortunate that you have endometriosis and uh, fibroids, it's actually not that surprising in a way. And again, if you found it incidentally and it's not causing you problems, 
um, generally speaking, uh, surgery is not usually considered to be the best option. Surgery is res is reserved for if it's causing obstruction, so it's blocking things, so it's blocking the uterus so you can't get pregnant, uh, or blocking the fallopian tube so you can't get pregnant, or blocking your ovarian function, or blocking your gut so you, you have problems with your bowel movements. Um, it's causing significant pain with intimacy, uh, like intercourse. It's causing um, problems with your urination, so it's blocking your ureters, which uh, where the urine flows through. Those are usually the indications for surgery. The simple presence of it, it's not causing any issues, is not a surgical indication as far as I'm aware. And, um, you know, I looked into the research for this. So just so you know. And definitely using this holistic approach with or without medications is important. Doing everything you can to improve inflammation in your body, anything that could be driving that aromatase activity, is just generally going to be helpful to your whole body health. And one of the signs that it's improving would be a decrease in your endometriosis, a decrease in your fibroid size potentially, definitely decrease in your endometriosis pain. You're looking for that too. And probably, you know, you might be focused on the endometriosis and fibroids, but if you've got inflammation going on there, it's probably showing up in other areas of your body, like your hormone balance, your gut health, maybe your skin, all those sorts of things. So catching it now and taking action from now on uh, will not just help your current condition with endometriosis, but your future health outcomes in many other areas. So Brittany and others here, I'm so grateful you're joining me today because this will make a huge difference for your health if you take this on. Knowledge is power, but wisdom is knowledge and action. And, you know, uh, knowledge without action is useless. So don't just sit here and listen to me, right? Go out there and do the work. All right. It's so worth it. Um, and I, from personal experience, it does actually help. I did have a fibroid and I reduced it naturally through these methods. So that was my indication of inflammation. That was my genetic manifestation of inflammation. So in summary, stress before and during endometriosis worsens the disease amount, so the burden, like how much endometriosis you have, and the severity of the endometriosis in terms of inflammation that causes pain. And that happens through immune system activation. And that is new science, very exciting, very important to know about because it really empowers us to take action about reducing stress. So the goal is to reduce stress. And one tip is to do five minutes of cyclic sighing a day, which has been shown in research to reduce stress even more than five minutes of mindfulness meditation. And again, that's one breath in with a longer exhale. Feels so good. So if you're uh, joining me next week for my Wild Wisdom Show, I'm going to be covering the topic that's so hot in the news right now. And right now it's... Um, uh, July 2023. So it's topical noun for the next couple of years because this will come into play within the next couple of years is a question of whether or not Health Canada is sabotaging our supplements and natural health products. Uh, and I'm only going to cover facts, no drama. There's been a lot of fear and drama being driven up in social media. And, uh, you know, I'm going to really unpack this. I've been, um, you know, I'm doing my homework. I'm getting in touch with Health Canada. I'm doing a lot of research behind it. So by next week, um, I hope to have incredibly factual information for you so that we can decide if there's anything we need to do to act um, or if everything's, you know, okay or somewhere in the middle, you know, what, what is going on here? Because I definitely use and recommend supplements, which are natural health products, um, and if they are going to be impacted by Health Canada's new fee proposed schedule, um, which on the surface looks like, you know, they're, they're basically um, charging new fees um, to the natural health product industry, which could impact supplement availability and prices, we need to understand what's going on because we have a window of opportunity to act if we need to act before it gets implemented within the next couple of years. So I look forward to seeing you there. And thank you to those of you who joined me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your comments and your questions. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a lovely rest of your day, evening, or night. And if you enjoyed this, if you're catching this on a replay, please save, share, and subscribe. Sharing is caring. And I appreciate it because more women need to know this information so that they can end their suffering and experience their best health. See you next time. Bye.